Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, everybody enjoying the con so far? You got an hour left. If you haven't had to start having a good time yet, it's too late. You missed the boat this time. So uh, um, first thing I want to do, and I know a lot of people have been giving the goons a hard time out here, and, uh, you know, they don't, get, they don't ever get their due. Let's give a good round of applause for the goons out here and the hard work they're doing. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is a little bit about insider threat. And uh, when you think about it, the insider threat is facilitated primarily by the security folks in your organizations. And the goons are out here protecting everybody out here. They're protecting you and I from the insider threat in this, uh, during the event out here. So they've got a hard job. Nobody ever gets any credit. And the security guys, if anybody works in security in their organization, they know they never get any credit. And they never get any money either. So you have to be real creative in what you do. So... Um, uh, well, my name is Tony Rucci, and um, there's who I am. And uh, I spent 21 years in the Army. I was a counterintelligence special agent. I retired back in 2004, and um, I now work for Department of Energy out at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. As, as with a lot of these DEF CON events, I have to caveat it. I don't speak for Department of Energy and all that other good hoo-ha and everything like that. But I do speak for Department of Energy on quite a few things, and I do give a, a talk very similar to this. This is, um, this is really about a three-and-a-half to four-and-a-half-hour um, uh, session that I give. In fact, I give it out at InfoSec, and, I, and I'll be out there with a half-day seminar um, in March down there. This is my cheesy plug. But um, um, So we're going to talk about, uh, about a little, bit, little under an hour, but um, I like to call myself a dirty, smelly contractor because now that I, I used to be a Fed, uh, I'm no longer a Fed, by the way, and uh, T-Dub. I like his art, so I asked him if I could borrow it and throw up there. But uh, it, we, when we go in there and we do some work in the Beltway, we always get called dirty, smelly contractors every time I look at your badge and they see the C on there. So I kind of have grown fond of that. I'm a diehard Tennessee Falls fan. I've been married for 26 years. So, you know, there's all your intel you guys can collect on me. You just start doing your homework. But uh, my son recently moved out of the house. We're empty nesters now, and now the fun really starts. So any of y'all who've got kids who've moved out, now you know the fun really starts. That's when you start buying all your toys. Got my Harley now. So all that good stuff. So why am I giving this? Uh, it was really supposed to be a two-part talk. Um, it was going to give uh, really from the hiring perspective and the defensive perspective uh, from, the, from the company's eyes over at Black Hat. And they had a lot of great briefings and presentations out there this year. So I got kicked to the curb. So I'm talking out here. But uh, I, and really my intent was to flip this around and really give it uh, to you from the higher uh, or from the um, uh, prospective candidate's perspective. And so when you guys are going out there and you're looking at companies and, and, and you're interviewing and they're hiring you, to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what they're doing or what they should be doing when they're, when they're hiring you. But I'll really talk from the first person uh, on the, uh, the company's perspective. But um, uh, when, you, when you start looking at it, from, when you look at today's economy now, uh, as the economy is, tr is struggling, people are having a hard time, layoffs, lots of layoffs, um, people having to come up with creative ideas, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's really stressing families when you've got yourself setting a mortgage, um, you're making money, and you've, you've kind of grown accustomed to that type of lifestyle, and all of a sudden that's swept out from under your feet in one day, and now you're trying to, to figure out what you're going to do, and people will come up with some uh, crazy ideas uh, from time to time, as we'll see. But the thing I really want to draw attention to, and dude will come up here. This is the reason why we're having uh, events like uh, DEF CON and things like this. It's really, it's a networking event. It's able for you guys to come together and all of us to come together and put ideas together. But it's for young folks like Doodle right here. Uh, th this is Doodle's first DEF CON. And uh, she's 13 years old from South Carolina. I want you all to give Doodle a big old round of applause. <laughs> it's folks like Doodle who are up there like a, a sponge. Um, first day, came out here, I saw her up there in uh, Hacking Hardware Village, a hardware hacking village, and she had that, you all seen that electronics board up there. I mean, back when I was a kid, you go on a radio shack for 20 bucks, and, and we had the wires, and we were coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas, you know, back then. And uh, so she's up there, and, and I asked her if she was going to port that to her, to her badge, and, and, you know, she didn't get one of the badges, so... We hooked her up and got her one of the badges, and I think she's going to probably win the hacking contest here in a couple of years. But uh, go ahead and have a seat, Doodle. Appreciate it. I don't mean to embarrass you. But, but it's about passing on the ideas and tradition and vision, you know, and, and, and I challenge everybody to, to 
you know, to do that and to share ideas. And as you're sitting off with when your little pull asides and your, and your uh, party groups, it, it's it's about having fun as well. But it's also about sharing ideas and challenging the filters. You know, we 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 deserve unfiltered uh, information, and too often that happens to us. All right, I'll get to the real talk now. Enough of that other stuff. All right, so here's the here's the uh, agenda we're going to talk through. Really going to talk to you about uh, insider threats and. and uh, um, how to detect them, and how to go about maybe through a hiring perspective or hiring process. And so put yourself in whatever shoes you are, if you're on the hiring and the corporate side, industrial side, or if you're on the candidate side. So who are the insiders is the first question you need to ask. And it's pretty much everybody. Everybody who touches your business process or your piece or your corporation or your organization. It's the folks who you work with, you collaborate with. It's visitors you bring in. If they touch not only your systems, but if they touch your people as well. If they have influence and they can influence your decision-making process, that becomes a threat. Um, if it's a negative uh, influence, of course. Uh, but the intent is that you're, you're collaborating. So... We look at some preconditions, and what I'm going to do is just kind of walk down uh, each of these preconditions here for you. Lots of motives for people to, uh, to uh, uh, present themselves as threats to an organization or commit espionage, and that's kind of the sense that I, I think of. Um, you know, my whole life made a, a, a turn to the right. I bit, did a dog leg back in, uh, I guess it's late 80s now. Uh, is when I think about it. I, I, I was just a sh straight-laced, uh, traditional espionage guy, and uh, sitting in my office, you know, well, they do have traditional espionage, but uh, just sitting in my office, and I, was, and I skipped lunch one day, and uh, somebody came in with their hair on fire saying, who knows anything about computers? Well, I was the only one there, so I said, I've got a trash 80 on my desk at home, and uh, that's all I knew, really. I mean, I was just, I wasn't any kind of investigator with uh, computer crimes or anything at that point. And it turned out that uh, you guys may have heard Jim Christie uh, uh, talk about his case for uh, this circuit years ago. Well, that was my very first computer crimes investigation, and I, wor I worked uh, just very low level running some leads out in East Tennessee and uh, 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 Southeast Kentucky out there. And from that point on, in that case, everybody who worked it became a became immediate expert in their field and, and seizing evidence and, and taking down a system and doing the forensics analysis on them and chain of custody of evidence and how to make sure that, that evidence isn't tainted. And you became that resident expert. So you started getting called out in a lot of cases in the whole nine yards. So, yeah, we milked it for a little while. But, uh, but it, it started a career path. And then all of a sudden they started creating the, 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 the forensics. But... Um, with that, you started developing a lot of um, a, a lot of policy and, a, and a lot, of course, a lot of our guides. And over the years since then, you start looking at it and you can develop, you know, or determine what people's motives are. And of course, the big three is always, uh, you know, uh, greed, disgruntlement, and revenge. And uh, you know, m money money is is the big thing, really. Uh, people are going to do anything illegal for money. Uh, money talks. But at the same time, um, nowadays, people are just trying to get back at you, especially if uh, in this economy, um, when you get your pink slip from, from a company, somebody says, hey, you know, the boss comes in and says, you've got two weeks and, and, you know, go find something else and we'll help you put your resume out there. Well, that's when people really become a, a threat to your organization because they start scavenging everything. They start backing up their own disks, their, their, their data, and they're going to take their Rolodexes with them. And uh, I'm dating myself, but uh, they're, they're, they're taking their contacts with them. And uh, so those are things that you need to be cognizant of. So people are motivated by lots of different things. And, you know, a cup of coffee is enough to, to, to motivate some folks there. And I love this, this uh, little story back from, from 2005, and Verisign did that. And they really, they just went out there and uh, was asking people out in front of Starbucks, you know, if you can give up your data, we'll give you a Starbucks card. And some people, I like, the, I like the idea. The guy didn't have enough time to go out there, so he sent his assistant out there. So that's great. But, you know, for somebody to commit espionage or somebody to, to commit this, this serious crimes and cross that line, uh, they've got to be able to, to dig deep down inside them and overcome some of their inhibitions. And, and uh, we've, we've all got morals and ethics. Everybody's got a varying degree. And uh, so, you know, somebody like Bob Hansen, um, and, and if we've got time here at the end, I've got a short video of uh, Bob Hansen when, uh, on his last day of freedom back in Feb uh, February 18th, for about the last uh, couple of minutes of his freedom, when he went out and made his last dead drop, and the FBI did the habeas grabis on him. 
And uh, incidentally, it was my current boss, Mike Rochford. Uh, any of you guys see the movie Breach? Yeah. If you didn't see the movie Breach, get out and see it. It's a pretty interesting movie. There's a lot of, a lot of Hollywood in it. But um, you may recognize my boss, Mike. Um, he was played by a, about a five foot eight blonde gal with long blonde hair. Yeah. That was, that was Mike. But um, uh, he used to be, he, he, well, she sells more tickets than him. Let's be truthful. He's, he's a pretty ugly guy. I wish I had a picture of him. And so. Can we stop the camera on that part? Edit that piece of it. My, my evals do. <laughs> no, no, he, he's, he's the one who told me that. But, uh, you know, Hollywood, Hollywood needs to sell tickets. But uh, the reality is um, um, that, uh, well, I don't know where the hell I was going with that. Uh, but he was, he, was, uh, he, he, was, he was in the FBI for, for 30 years, and he was the chief of the counter-espionage and counter-terrorism division. And uh, uh, that's, one, that's one of the things that he, he talked about with, with Bob Hansen. You know, he, he really gave you that persona, and when he was leading that double life, that he was a really stand-up guy, went to church, or went to mass um, nearly every day. And uh, he would push that off on, on his folks and everybody that he came in contact with. But he was really lived in this dark world, uh, dark life out there. And uh, he had crossed the line a long time ago. So go, I encourage you to go out there and see that movie. I don't get any royalties or anything. So at some point in time, you're going you're gonna to get so stressed out, and then something's going to happen in your life, and, you, and something's going to trigger that, that ultimate response. And you say, you know, I've been thinking of bad things. And uh, a buddy of mine, John uh, Bumgarner over there, he, he and I, we, we kind of work in the same mindset. We sit around, we think of bad things. And uh, we, we, we sit, sit around just, just thinking of bad ideas and think, you know, this could really happen. This is feasible or plausible. And, and people tell you to go away, and they, they tell you to go lock yourselves in a, another dark closet somewhere just so that they don't have to hear it a lot of times. But that's the same thing with somebody who's considering crossing the line. They think of, you know, you know what, I'm really disgruntled. Uh, the, the, the organization screwed me over. I'm, I'm taking a 10% pay cut this year so that we can all, you know, work, uh, continue to march. And uh, it's, it's really getting to me. And then something happens, and, you know, maybe they take away your company car or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, that, that trigger, that's all it takes. And I'll, and I'll show you a few examples here later on with some um, case studies here of some people who, who did pop. But, uh, and everybody deals with uh, re emotional responses differently. Some people will drink too much. Some people will, you know, take your system down and, uh, you know, load up a lot of value in your, in your network that will trigger somewhere down the road. But uh, so here's a here's a short list here, and it's very logical, and it, you guys have seen this before. It's a short list to make sure that you're protecting your organization, obviously. Uh, least user privileges. This is something that just blew my mind in 2004 when I retired, and I came out to uh, uh, DOE, and I was signing up that day and getting my badge issued to me. Uh, the la lady over the security office, she shakes up her, uh, starts giving her mouse the, uh, the you know the morning rattle. And it takes about five minutes for everything to wake up. And she's got a nice waterfall screensaver on there. And I says, wow, I can't believe you guys even got that crap on there. And she says, ah, I says, it must be an old box. She says, oh, no, no, it's pretty new. She, but, but she had loaded up so much crap on her box. And, she, and, of course, when I finally did wake up, she had everything open all the time. And um, she says, yeah, I downloaded this a couple weeks ago and installed it. And it's pretty neat. It looks pretty good. And I says, well, you, you, you can install everything. you got admin rights. I says, yeah, you must be in the security office. That's okay, huh? Oh, no, no, we all do. Everybody, you'll have admin rights. Everybody, the whole organization has admin rights. Not today, but that's how it was a few years ago. So uh, that just blew my mind. So you've got to be able to manage that. And uh, some of the folks obviously are able to, to remote in, and you've got to restrict the scope of, the, uh, of remote access, and you can't let everybody have full reign, uh, especially the folks who are admin. In this case, it was, it was everybody. But, uh, and for, for those who do remote in, you need to make sure that not everybody has um, uh, remote access. Not everybody does. I'm going to talk a little bit deeper here in a few minutes about employee, uh, monitoring employee behavior. And the, the primary one is, is take a look back in the backgrounds of, of your, your employees. Just by a show of hands, and, and they're not going to record you or anything like that, how many of you guys rely solely on the resume of your potential candidates for your organizations because you don't think it's right to look into their background and do open source on the internet. How many of you? Yeah, you're not going to admit it out here. You would be surprised how many companies I talk to who say, oh, no, they're not our, they're not our employee yet. We can't, we can't go out there and, and do an open source. We can't look them up on the internet. That would be a violation of their privacy. When you put it on the internet, you kind of give that privacy up. Um, wait till I show you the pictures from the party last night. 
They're already out there. Um, but you need to screen your personnel. I mean, it's very basic. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna bring somebody in to your you know the, the circle of friends like the Fockers, right? Your little your little inner circle. Uh, <laughs> You want to you want to you want to keep an eye on them, and, and you want to make sure that they're the vet, that they're the best candidate for an or, uh, for your uh, uh, organization. But you want to make sure that that you're not bringing the threat to your back your front door. Now we're a little unique in my world. We invite 4,700 foreign nationals from you name the country out to our our laboratory every year on purpose. I mean, so we invite the insider threat out there. So we've got a fairly robust program, and we try to mitigate the best we can. Are they getting us? Yeah, you probably read the news. We had PII divulged uh, out there um, uh, last year out, out in the, uh, on the internet. It happens. It's going to happen. You've got to be able to, to mitigate it, and you've got to be able to. Uh, you've got to have an emergency response plan and be able to to take action accordingly. But um, a lot of companies are afraid to do that if they're if they're uh, going through that whole process. So one of the things that I used to do, um, and I didn't really mention it up front, my last seven years when I was in uh, CI, I was the counterintelligence operations officer at the White House military office. So we would go through a robust counterintelligence screening process for every candidate that would that would come to work there on the 18 acres, and uh, so. Uh, it, it trickled down. We had uh, several um, security offices through, like, White House Communications Agency and Air Force One and those guys as well. And the third headquarters, for every position that we would hire, we'd do no, we'd do no less than 10 interviews. And uh, they, we'd, we'd get applications from a large pool, and we'd, we'd screen them down just by the resumes themselves. And then we'd do the CI screenings. We'd, we'd bring them in, and we like to call it a murder board. So we, we'd, we'd put them in front of the board. Uh, and it was really one-on-one -on -one interviews. But really, we can knock out half of them right away just by doing financial and, and pulling up credit checks and, and looking to see if somebody's going to be susceptible to blackmail um, or, or somewhere like that. Because if you're, if you're not managing your finances, uh, you know, like I said, what, what was the, one of the things? Money, wa money talks, right? So somebody opens up a suitcase. We used to use this in our, in our briefings years ago. Somebody were to open up a suitcase and it had $10 million, well, maybe not even that in a lot of cases, but $10 million, you'd think, you'd at least pause. I don't, know how, I don't care how patriotic and how loyal you are to the cause and your organization or your country, you'd stop and think. And, you, and, you, and you, it would pass through your mind, you'd say, could I get away, get, could I get away with it? What, you know, what, what would I do with the money, or how would I manage it? So I, I don't care how loyal you are, and, and you know, we used to always ask the question, how many of you think that, you know, it would everybody stand up? You know, and then, and then they would ask the question. Almost everybody would sit down, but, but it's the case. That you, when you look at it, uh, when Rochford gave the guy who gave up uh, um, uh, Hanson, uh, when he went overseas to, 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 to do the, uh, the pitch to him, he gave him $7.1 million in a briefcase. And that guy was telling him, there's no way. There, you know, my family is, is taken care of. I'm, I'm, I'm very well off. And there's nothing you can do that's going to change my mind. And I'm not going to give him up. He said, let's meet. He sat down with him, opened up the suitcase. $7.1 million made the guy talk. So it's a great story. And, uh, um, you know, take a look. Go dig up the data on it. And uh, there's lots of handsome reports out there. And uh, if, if, you're, if you're in GOV sector, you can, you can pull off all the classified reports as well. Or maybe if you're not in GOV sector, if you're really creative, uh, maybe somebody out here can pull that stuff down. But uh, um, do open source checks. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that stuff here in just a minute. Uh, but, but one of the things that's really important as well, that keeps the, keep the organizations uh, alive and keep the people excited about uh, being a part of protecting the, uh, the culture of your organization is take advantage of training opportunities. And this is a great training opportunity as well. Uh, send your folks to events like this and not only the IT sector, but security conferences and bring people in to talk to your organizations and uh, with fresh ideas. You don't want the talking head, you know, your head of security sitting up there every week on, on, you know, on Monday morning and giving the weekly stand up or something like that and just beating down everybody that pretty soon it's just like peanuts, you know, the teachers womp, womp, womp. Bump, bump, and, and, and that's the case. Um, and, and especially like, like, well, I'm doing it here, death by PowerPoint. I've only got 340 more slides. But, uh, but seriously, you know, you want to have some fresh ideas. And we'll bring uh, case officers in from, from uh, respective agencies. We'll bring folks in who, who had their stuff compromised and talk about how they responded and what, uh, what mistakes they made. And uh, you can't be shy about talking about your mistakes to a certain degree, of course. 
um, you know, except banking industry, they never talk about uh, their compromises because that has a serious impact. Um, but, you know, bring folks in and, and give fresh perspectives and, and something that they're doing wrong and something that they're doing right and take away from that. So we'll talk about a little bit about the co uh, contributing factors. Excuse me here. It's been a long week, and, and the hot, cold, hot, cold kind of kills you. I'm sitting at a poker table at 4 o'clock in the morning, too. Oh, was that thing on? Did I use my outside voice? Sorry about that. I'm up at least. Okay. So when you start looking down contributing factors to somebody who's going to be an insider threat or potentially an insider threat to your organization, you start looking down some of these little checklists. And, um, uh, you know, and you kind of, kind of chuckle because as you look down these, you start thinking about all these folks that you're working with. And I've got a, a pretty robust list uh, down there in a second. But uh, uh, years ago, when uh, you were dealing with folks who had security clearances, um, uh, if, you, if you admitted to any kind of gambling, uh, you all automatically became uh, suspect and you're under the microscope. But uh, as, since uh, 2003, when Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker out there, he's, he's uh, in my poker club in Knoxville. So uh, he, uh, he really turned the, the whole idea of, of online poker and, and home games and the whole nine yards, because he was an amateur, and he really brought to the forefront. And all of a sudden, you're seeing poker on TV, and it's kind of the cool thing to do. Unless you're using your mortgage and, you know, all your life savings, you're, you're dunking your car out there and throwing car keys up at a poker table, then you've got an issue. And then you, you, you see the numbers up here on the billboards up here. You guys need to give them a call. But, it, it, you know, keep in mind, it's excessive spending and gambling and things like that. It's kind of like playing the stock market. You, you, if you're going to gamble, you're going to play the stock market. You need to be willing to walk away from that money and, and, and have it not impact your life. But let's focus a little bit on the Internet presence. Um, you know, you start looking out there and look on the Internet, and folks are going to have an Internet presence, or most will. Surprisingly enough, it, it kind of turns me around. When I, when I start looking on the Internet, and I don't find somebody. That makes me more suspicious than, than anything. And, but every now and again, you do find those folks. And, uh, you know, if you're hiring them for your sysad or something like that, probably not, uh, not who you want to hire. But uh, so... When you start looking at it, you know, you're going to find pictures out there. And, you know, you, everybody's got their, their different uh, drop sites, photo bucket, whatever, where they put a few pictures out there of the parties and things like that, you know, doing a little keg standing. And <laughs> you might be the life of the party at the company or something like that. But, you know, you don't want to be the one who's always got the company parties out there. Doodle, cover your eyes. Cover your eyes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, so this morning when I went to go wake John up, um, I'm sorry, John. I, I need to give you credit on that photo, too. But uh, so there we go. Here's that kind of looks like DT, don't you think? I don't know. But, you know, you might have a little value added. There, so that's an old school hack right there. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, while those are kid around, those are those are folks, you know, when you're young, you're going to do some retarded things. But take a look at this. And I've got a nice little story with this here. Here's a guy who's truly a CEO candidate. And think about it. Do you want this guy who's got Swinger's Lifestyle profile, married with four kids, and he's got a profile on there looking for threesomes, foursomes, oodlesomes, I don't know, um, lots of sums. But what stands out in your mind? Guy doesn't have his wife on there, so maybe this isn't something that's part of their lifestyle. You know, it, 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 it's okay for some folks if that's what they want to do, but he doesn't have his wife on there. You know, could that be a potential uh, element of blackmail uh, on the guy, and you, and you hold that over his head? All right, so, you know, it just be smart. I mean, this kind of stuff is easy to pull off. Um, Facebook, MySpace, and all those other LinkedIn and everything like that, you know, we all probably, if you've got, a, if you've got an account, you probably got a little bit too much of information on there, uh, especially the ones that are the more professional oriented, but you still start bragging about yourself a little bit, and that's just human nature. You do it in resumes as well. If you post your resume, um, you start dropping them out in places. They're easily retrieved because you can just post out there like you're going to hire folks, and you can see who's got a specific skill set. But I kind of turn this around since I'm a CI puke. I think of it in different terms. I look at it like, well, maybe – he didn't put this out there. Maybe I don't like the guy. Maybe I work with him, and he pissed me off. And maybe he got a contract that I, I really wanted. 
So I went out there, and I got a picture of him at the last conference because he's got a conference badge on. Maybe I put that on there. Maybe I put... Yeah, it might be. What are you doing on the gay website? How do you know? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. No, but you're absolutely right. Do something like that. Um, uh, and, a, and a perfect perfect story is um, a guy who, who had a MySpace page, and um, uh, he, was a, he was a CIA case officer, and he had cover name. Well, he had a MySpace with his true name out there. And it was a contact of a contact of a contact. Maybe. Or maybe it wasn't. But regardless, there was, a fa- there was a picture of him, and he had, you know, a little bit of information, just enough information about where he was, what he was doing, and it just kind of sat back and watched. What do you have on your MySpace and, and Facebook? You've got the little wall of, hey, what's up? How you doing? Everybody leaves their little comments on there. Wanted to see who knew him and, and, and really just track and see where his connections jump out to. So those are kind of interesting little ideas, and, and you know you can do the same thing with something like that. I'm, not that I'm highly recommending that you go to Swingers Lifestyle or anything like that, unless you're into that. So you can kind of run down a little checklist like this, and you know you could probably think about yourself falling in the in the couple of those categories. I know it's kind of small, but uh, years ago when um, I, I started signing up to come to things like Black Hat and DEF CON, uh, people in my organization you know, kind of scratch their head and say, why the hell would you want to go to that? But, you know, and you probably still get a little bit of that this this day and age. But I I think not so much anymore as they're starting to build things like U.S. uh, um, um, uh, Cyber Command and things like that. It's really getting out there, so it's it's taking off. So here's here's a cute little uh, story here. The other night we're in Black Hat going to the sushi party over there that CORE put on. Anybody, Anybody go to that? Did you eat lots of sushi, or did you just stand around like this most of the time because it was so crowded in there because they always give away way too many badges on that. So everybody was standing outside there um, getting started with that thing. And uh, so John, he had gotten a badge for some guy that he hadn't met before, so he's he's, uh, waiting to meet him up out there, and he's supposed to link up at a certain time. The guy's running a little late, so John shoots up. Are you guys able to read that up there? Yeah. So... So he kind of runs down, runs down the, with the, some message traffic on there and, and kind of spooks him and says that he's, he's – and the guy says, who's this? He says, I've, I've, I'm the guy who's surfing the Internet off of your phone. And the guy um, kind of says, wow, that's kind of cool. He says, how do you do that? He says, the, the, the vendor didn't patch your phone's firmware. Oh, okay, now try. You want a job? He says, what, what, do you, uh, what for hacking your phone? He says, you be, he says, man, you still in. He says, you be killing my battery. <laughs> So, so John's going to get a good job out of it, and uh, I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, So, you know, the whole thing is he influenced him. Didn't have to really hack his – all he was doing was just playing with him and just sending, you know, a bunch of meaningless texts while we were out there. We were kind of bored. ADD set in. And uh, so, so, so he influenced him, though. And, and that's, that's the whole thing. You know, with terrorism, insider threat, you don't necessarily have to, to um, completely follow through with anything. All you have to do is influence that organization, and you've been effective. So the sushi uh, social engineering now becomes an integral part of future talks. But now there's the intentional insider, and then there's the unintentional, a.k.a. idiot. Um, now, I don't know the legitimacy of this. I looked it up on Snopes and, uh, just to see if this was real, but it's a really cool slide. Um, and, and you probably can't read the text way back up there, but it'll be, it'll be on the, the, you know, the slides archived up there. Guy had a video card, and um, he, so he shot into uh, uh, help desk, I guess, saying that I don't have any pictures. I don't know how this picture ended up out there if he didn't have pictures. But his buddy told him that it was supposed to fit into the little slot thingies on the, on the motherboard. So and it has little grooves in there so that you can cut away the slot thingies to make it fit. So he cut it away, and it doesn't work now. I don't know. I don't think you can take that back to Best Buy and get your money back now. So here's one. Give a little uh, uh, props to uh, to to Wes McGrew. Uh, you guys might have been tweeting with him, uh, McGrew Security, but. Uh, so this is a little story about the double insider threat here. And this guy here, you guys may have heard about, uh, to, about Jess McGraw. So he's a, he's a security guard, a night security guard out of the hospital in Dallas. And um, so, you know, what do you do? You sit around and wait for somebody to rob the hospital, I guess, and make sure that nobody's taking people's um, bags and, and all that stuff and bedpans. 
But uh, so he got bored and jumped on the box, and he was able to hack the HVAC system and patient records in there. So he can influence a lot of things out there in a the hospital. Everybody's always either hot or too cold, and he can influence it. But what he took it, he he crossed that line, and uh, he took it a step further, and he dropped his uh, his um, uh, termination letter to the to the company, saying, "I'm going to stop working here. My last day is going to be July 3rd." And he was on the blogs out here and uh, inciting um, uh, an attack, a DDoS attack on the hospital on the 4th of July. Little little patriotic victory party, I guess. Well, now he's, he's opened himself up to some felonies, uh, um, kind of crossed that line. But you know, really, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he got arrested, and he's uh, charged with downloading malicious code and threatening public health and safety because he could potentially shut down some, some people's life support or something like that that they're sitting on in the hospital. Now it's more of a therapeutic and sports medicine kind of uh, hospital, but uh, regardless. So he's looking at 10 years and $250,000 in fine. And... Um, and uh, what I really like about this one here is this is a double insider threat because the guy who dimed him out is one of the guys in his hacker club um, in the uh, ETA. So and he, he exposed him by talking on uh, another blog, and, and, of course, they're posting all their photos on, or their movies of it on uh, YouTube. So it, it became known that way. So kudos to the folks who dimed him out. Um, but I like that double threat. So just this last weekend, as we were rolling out here for Black Hat, um, the Palm Pre came out at uh, Best Buy. Anybody get one for $99? Anybody have one? Did you pay 199 bucks? That's what it's supposed to How much you pay? I saw a hand go up there. There you go. See, if you'd gone to Best Buy on the 26th, you could have got one for 99 bucks in New York. So... <laughs> So what happened apparently was that uh, there was some there was some talk and there were some uh, posters or something like that that were being written up and uh, managers shut it down on the 26th saying it wasn't supposed to go out and the price was supposed to be 199. Allegedly somebody just either didn't hear it or discounted it and so that whole New York area they got uh, palms and all the best buys out there and they put it into the systems. Uh, so you rang it up it didn't matter what was on the barcode in there it said 99 dollars and. Uh, and I don't know how many were disclosed yet. I, I, I go into news blackout when I come to something like this because I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I listen to the news when I'm getting dressed in the morning. But uh, So I really hadn't followed up on this uh, so much. I can't wait to get back and see what's going on with this. But, you know, my thought right away is, is this an insider threat? Somebody's pissed off and, and maybe he he got stuck on a floor one day. And, uh, um, you know, okay, I'll get back to you. I want a Palm Pre, so I'm gonna, or my buddies want Palm Pre's or something like that, you know. What better insider to have is the guy over at Best Buy if you need gadgets. So, so here's another one. Tell me what you see. Spot, spot the excitement on this picture. Yeah. So in the Apple Store, in uh, where is it? North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina Apple Store out there where where John's at, uh, on the barcode reader. They're using Microsoft products uh, in the Apple Store out there. So you, you'd have thought that they'd have probably had, you know, one of their own you know, homegrown readers or something like that. But uh, so Microsoft is able to, to uh, infiltrate the Apple stores, and pretty soon it'll be uh, AppleSoft is my prediction. Don't, don't, you, know, you can go to the – we're in the casinos. I'm sure there's probably a line on it. Ultimate insider threat. How many folks are married? You got that husband-wife trust relationship or spouse-spouse relationship. Um, you just got an element of, of appreciation for, for coming home at night, regardless of what you do, and be able to talk to your spouse and, and feel comfortable in what you do. Uh, you don't expect your wife or your husband to, to talk about, okay, I'm in cover status, and I've actually got call signs, code names, and then they go on my Facebook when I take my job, and I'm supposed to, sign, or I'm supposed to start work on the uh, 4th of July or whatever day it was, 1st of July, and uh, go on her Facebook and say congratulations to my husband, um, who's the head of MI6, and, uh, and uh, use his call sign of C uh, on there, which was uh, not very well known. And uh, so, so she, she's the insider threat to him. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what goes on with that, but uh, that's kind of comical. So here's one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, 
uh, Leandro was a guy who worked uh, at the White House. He worked for Vice President, uh, Vice President's Office of Security, and he's a Marine E7. And um, so he worked in the OVP staff from '99 to uh, '03 uh, over there, and he worked he worked badging and access control and did a lot of trip reports for those guys. And uh, so um, we had uh, President Arroyo over uh, for a visit, and Clinton had him in or had her in, excuse me. Um, had her in and and was able to meet with uh, a lot of the Filipino nationals there and and Leandro being one of them and a lot of the White House mess and they established a rapport and relationship with his, her chief of staff and they stayed in contact for uh, years after the visit in 2001 and uh, uh, ended up ultimately leaving uh, the White House when he retired in '03 and went to work for um, the FBI. Um, uh, the FMIT up in uh, uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, up there as an analyst, FBI analyst. And uh, uh, later on, you find that he, he was uh, disclosing uh, classified documents. He had lots of classified documents uh, on his systems at home, and he had been sending classified information to uh, the chief of staff and uh, uh, the president uh, about you know, what was going on and what he was working on. And... Uh, so he was sentenced in July of uh, 2007 for 10 years. And uh, so, you know, it's just he's, they, were, they were tugging on those hard strings. The Chinese do it and the Filipinos do it. You're, you're very sympathetic to your homeland. It's a very poor country. Sir? What disclosed the breach? Pardon me? What disclosed the breach? Your eyes detected. What, what trip did you do? It was a uh, periodic review. He was doing uh, um, uh, his uh, five-year update, and um, he blipped. And then, and then as they started um, running down the paper trail from there, they started doing file reviews. And, and then um, uh, somebody else who was working with the uh, – and it was part of the chief of staffs uh, from a royal staff um, kind of tipped it off and gave him up. We're going to have a question and answer session uh, over here uh, afterwards. So we would be happy to kind of go into detail on a pull side on that too if, you, if you'd like. So – um, that, that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and the only, only out that I have on that one is that my boss did the, the CI screening interview with that guy, so we're all standing around the office as soon as this, this thing uh, broke, and we all called each other. We'd all gone to our, our, our next lives by then, and, and Rich, uh, Pete, and I, we're all calling each other going, who did his interview? And, and, and buddy of mine, Rich Swearens, he still works there. And uh, so we started looking through there, and, and whew, it wasn't me. So he didn't, he didn't get by. But anyway, something that's very consistent with folks who are committing espionage is that they're very well organized and, uh, and they can manage their time and, and their assets. And, and so everybody always thinks that they're really good people. And, and this, is a, this is kind of a common statement for a lot of folks who live around folks who commit espionage. Damn, he's such a nice guy. He just seemed to be pretty level-headed. And that's because you're balancing two lives. You have to have that management skill. Nice guy. He's just a shitbag. So I'm sorry. I use my out, outside voice again. So here's another one out there in East Tennessee, Roy Oakley. Um, he's a janitor out there at the East Tennessee Technology Park. And what they're doing out there is they're demobbing. Um, um, there's a very lengthy process in uh, destroying uh, nuclear facilities and nuclear production facility. So we hired a whole lot of uh, janitors out there and the folks to be able to supervise uh, the process out there because we just ha can't have construction and, and facilities folks out there just walking away with uh, materials and, and uh, um, compromising because it's still a classified site out there. So we brought them all into a room and uh, gave them uh, counterintelligence security awareness briefings and, and, and really just told them, said, hey, look, folks, you know, the technology that you guys are destroying out here and, and you're working on, uh, you know, lots of folks would be interested in this technology today. It remains classified today. Take the French, for instance, and, uh, and, and kind of ran down that whole line and just say, you know, this is something that would be interest of, of interest to them. Well, this knucklehead took that as a, hey, I got a great idea. <laughs> That's never happened. I think I'll call the French and say, hey, I've got access to some stuff that you're interested in. Motivation, guy's got a whole bunch of rental properties. He's falling behind uh, in maintenance and, and payments on them. He didn't have people filling out the, the rentals, so he's, he's eating the rent himself and the, and the mortgage on them all. So he calls the French embassy. Long story short, information gets back to us. And uh, about a month or so later, some guy with a French accent, accent calls him up. And uh, says, hey, I'd like to meet with you. Well, let's see if we can do some business. Well, he says, okay, fly into Knoxville Airport. And he did. 
French guy flew in, and uh, except he was an FBI agent uh, that he met on the I met on the, the tarmac out there, and uh, so the rest is history uh, from there. So they they arrested him right there, and um, so he pled out, and as does in a lot of cases uh, when when you're dealing with espionage and classified information, you have discovery and the whole nine yards, and if it's going to go to uh, um, um, trial you're going to have to disclose all that and then you and so it's a whole mess and a lot of times they end up pleading out so he got six years uh in prison he started serving so n1 gen i mean you're familiar with this case uh, motorola so n1 gen um was a software engineer from 98 to 2008 um, um and for for motorola and she had tuberculosis and a couple other things going on in her life and um, so um, she had to take some leave. And during the time of leave, she made some contact and some unreported contact uh, back at her motherland. And uh, so long story short is, and I'll just kind of take, take you through the timeline with her. But uh, long story short is she's still uh, not been prosecuted. She's been indicted. She's had three indictments against her um, for several. You can see those down at the bottom. But uh, they were supposed to start the trial January uh, in January. And everything kind of gets held up, held up, because it keeps getting meatier and meatier as you start digging up more uh, discovery. So she joined Motorola. I'm not going to beat it to death a whole lot there, but uh, she started doing a little consulting on the side uh, with uh, one of their competitors. And you, you, you kind of, it's kind of not ethical to do that uh, in, in most companies, and unless they give you the uh, the moonlighting uh, privilege, but um, especially with your competitors. And uh, so. In April, she took a trip to, to China, and in uh, June, she came back and said, hey, I need to go on medical leave. got tuberculosis, emphysema, and a couple other things that are going on in her life. So they put her on a, a, um, a medical leave, and shortly after that, she went to China again. And then she comes back, and she goes to medical leave again. She takes a whole year off this time. And uh, who knows where she's at by the, uh, during that time. Well... While she was gone, they let her have access for a whole whole year. They let her have access, remote access, into the system uh, out there remotely. And so she was pulling down some PI. And uh, and then she comes back in June. And or, and uh, I'm sorry, she doesn't come back in June. She, just, she has some discussions um, with a, a, a Chinese technology company out there. And they probably worked up some sort of a deal. And so you can see the dates that she accessed the network again from China, nonetheless. And, and something that was told to her, and this was captured uh, along the way, is they started looking at phone records and, and uh, um, uh, forensics of her, her uh, laptop. Uh, this is a comment by uh, a Chinese executive. You should share in the full fruit of our, in the, in the fruit of our collective effort. And that's, uh, you know, once she started taking some of the documents. So there's indicators already that she's not just doing this because she's interested in, in a, being a sponge and working her way up to the top of the, of the organization. So in MI, we call that an indicator. So um, take you down to the last few days here in February of 07. Um, she withdrew $10,000 from her bank. And uh, she bought a one-way ticket. To, uh, to Beijing. Right away, that's an indicator, uh, especially somebody who's working in the States and, and you've got permanent residency out here. You, take, you do a one-way ticket nowadays, you're going to trigger all kinds of flags in the systems. And you might even get an extra couple minutes over in the security side there at TSA. And, uh, but, uh, so, so she told the boss that she was ready to come back to work, and so her badge was reactivated. Now, it's, I, I kind of think it's odd that they deactivated her, her security badge and access badge, but yet they left all her accounts uh, alive. Now, I know we've never seen that happen before. Somebody leaves a company, especially, you know, employees who terminate, and then you come back and, and you do an audit a month later and they're still in the system. That's never happened. Um, I'll bet you it happens where I'm at. So, so on the 26th, she reports to work, and uh, she, all right away, she starts visiting lots of folks and, and talking to project managers, and she's interested in the future and what, what's going on with uh, some uh, projects down the road. And uh, right away, she goes down, and she's got 200 documents that she pulls down. And, uh, and then she comes back at night. She's already a hard charger, trying to work her way back up at the top, and she comes in at 9 o'clock and starts sucking down a lot of data. And, and then she pulls out with bags of, of uh, items. So on the 27th, she sends an email saying that she's resigning again. So came in, and, and right away, flags should have been going crazy, but allegedly they weren't. 
And uh, after she, and now the, the kicker here is after she told him that she's resigning, she pulls down 65 more documents. And, uh, and then she withdraws $20,000 and then comes back that night again and, and pulls down some more data. And there we go. So on the February 28th, she's uh, at O'Hare going through uh, airport security, and they do a random check on her. Because there's no flag that's jumping in here at this point, even though she bought a one-way ticket. And uh, so this is what they find as, she, as they start going through her stuff. So they've got proprietary documents from Motorola. They've got a whole, she's got a whole bunch of Chinese documents, uh, technology books, uh, military, U.S. military technology books, some Chinese books, and a uh, uh, laptop. Well, I think uh, two or three thumb drives, four hard drives. Just, just go on a little vacation. So, and, and there's a couple CDs in there, 29 to be exact. So... See, if you're a real smart person, you put it all on a thumb drive, right? I don't know why you need those CDs. But anyway, maybe she didn't have time to process those big bags full of garbage and crap. So for those who aren't visual, here you go. Here's the textual version of what was on the other slide over there. I'll, I'll spare you the, the animation on it. But uh, suffice to say, she had lots of stuff. She claimed $10,000 on her, on her customs form, but she had $30,000. Now, here's the thing that just makes me fall out is they didn't let her get on her plane. They said, you can't fly. And they sent her away. You think they arrested her? Not, that, not at that point. She's arrested the next day, going through customs again on a one-way ticket because they said, you can't fly tonight because of all this. We've got to sort through it. So they let her fly the next day, or they, they, they were going to let her fly, and she was going through customs again, and they stopped her, and, and so be it. Uh, she was arrested. But uh, so Motorola is claiming $600 million of proprietary information was lost. And uh, the DOJ is saying uh, that they expect about $750,000 fine, and they're looking at 30 years. And, and as they start digging deeper and deeper and going through all the data, the, 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 the indictments are stacking up. So the takeaway from this is that you just need to, to keep the mindset that you need to inspire commitment amongst yourselves and, and, your, and your colleagues and you know you're you're building for the future, and it's the folks like uh, Doodle that you need to to inspire and and uh, protect your your assets and your proprietary assets. And uh, you got to watch out for those leet snack stores. So <laughs> this is really my talk. And I, I, again, I'll be over in um, uh, breakout room, I guess number four. Uh, for, for questions on there. So I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you.